welcome to another episode of What the, the Flock. Flock. <laughs> yes. Hoyt and Shell. I gotta tell you, I've been so excited to uh, tape, film some more episodes because I don't know about you, Hoyt, but I've had a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> this has definitely been uh, in all sorts of good ways stirring the pot. But first of all, welcome Matthew Walton from the other side of the pond. We're talking to Matthew in London or right outside of London. Correct, Matthew? Um, it's, it's Matthew Walpert. And so oh. no one ever gets my name right. So Walpert. <laughs> Walpert. But um, I'm, I, live in, um, I live about 75 miles from London on the, on the Kent coast. Just by the sea, like an old seaside town. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I'll definitely have to come visit you. I actually, really love, love it. Love it's love like London. an old, proper old school kind of English seaside town. Interesting. Well, you know, we actually have had quite a few listeners from like right around London, which I've really mm-hmm. loved communicating with them. So, hello to all our London listener listeners, by the way. So uh, before we jump in here, how about we do our quote of the day? I think we should. Okay. You own everything that happened to you. Tell your stories. If people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. And that's by Anne Lamott. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's a little Just bit of a foreshadowing what, of what we're going like to be doing. Is. Tell it like it is. <laughs> what we're going to be doing today. Um. So first of all, do you gentlemen mind if I share with you just a a few little updates before we get started? Go Uh, for it. I'm going to take my glasses off because they're glaring. So I'm going to blindly try to read and uh, make my way through this. Um, You know, surprise, surprise, as I've been in um, therapy, you know, in and out for many years, Checking in with my therapist as I start talking about this publicly, um, she has helped me with quite a bit. But even watching me, Hoyt, on camera, and I'm trying to not do it right now, the twitching, the squirming, the eye blinking. (laughs) She watched some of our, our YouTube episodes and she was like, what is going on? It's just classic PTSD. And I knew it was there, but when you when you visibly see it, I think I've had a different reaction to it. Like, God, do I do that all the time? Am I in business meetings, like squirming, blinking at people? Well, well just so you know, I don't notice it. Um, you know, I and certainly, oh, God. you know, I think, I think that listen, it takes it a huge amount of courage to go public about our stories and talk about these kind of sensitive issues. I think people are much more receptive than we realize, but all that anxiety of kind of coming clean and telling the truth and being transparent, uh, it, it, it's, it's stressful. And so you, ha- I think you just have to allow yourself to go on the journey of what that's going to be like. like. And that's what we want to do here, you know, on, on the podcast is give people kind of a safe terrain to kind yeah. of talk. And, and listen, no one's expected to be an expert. That's why we try to keep the kind of structure of these things pretty loose. Right. Um, because we should just, you know, realize that we're all, you know, kindred spirits here. We all have been through some rough stuff and this is a great opportunity to talk it through and, and feel safe and feel protected that no one's going to judge you one way or the other. Right. Well, it's it's interesting to watch it kind of bubble to the surface in real time, <laughs> you know, sure, sure. And, and, and it's good. You know, it, I always explain part of this process is like a pimple. It's like you have to get the infection out and it looks ugly for a little while, but it has to heal. <laughs> you know? sure, so, sure. Yeah. So burst away. Burst pop, away. Pop, pop Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for the, the graphic. So this is your opportunity, there. Matthew, to pop a few pimples. <laughs> pop a few pimples. Yeah. That sounds oh, gross. Yeah. <laughs> what was that, Matthew? I'm looking forward to popping pimples. There you go. Well <laughs> it, is, it is kind of satisfying when you think about it. You yeah. got to get that shit out, you know? Um, well, the other thing I wanted to share what, what she said, which was really helpful. She was like, Shell, it is good to cherry pick the good things, you know, that you can extract another pimple reference that you can extract from your your experience and uh, what you went through. She's like, but be careful, because in the cherry picking, 
when you're trying to find the good thing, she goes, just make sure you don't normalize the trauma or normalize the experience. And I thought, wow, that was really deep because I do, I am able to cherry pick the friendships and it brought me to Hoyd, it brought me to you, like the, you know, the, the kindred spirits that we all are. We've all been in a very similar foxhole together. But I really had to think through that because of, as we're chatting, all the holding back I was doing and not really wanting to go there and share some things, which now I'm more prepared to do and will do. But I thought, wow, that's a that's an interesting tightrope to walk is let's cherry pick the good for sure. But let's also not normalize how incredibly um, wrong and hard and ridiculous what we went through was. Does that make sense, Matthew? There's it's a, it's a it's a tightrope. Yeah, it's definitely a, a tightrope to walk. So yeah. anyways, yeah. I just wanted to get that out because even as I'm sitting here, I'm finding myself kind of relax more into my body and not want to twitch <laughs> and blink so much. But um I mean, <laughs> well, no. I mean and, and I think it's that's a nice segue into uh hearing your story, Matthew. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, uh you know, we we uh, talked a little bit off camera um kind of about the perfect storm a way these things kind of happen in our lives yeah. that kind of emerge um looking back at it you know in that kind of perfect storm scenario so um maybe tell us a little bit about where you were in your life a little bit you know who you are and where you were you were kind of coming from and when this kind of events the the uh, started to kind of come together to introduce you to this group and uh you know just kind of give us uh give us the uh as we say in the acting business set the scene set the scene I'll set the, yeah I'll set the scene well um, and matthew I, I, when you yeah. explain it explain how you and i know each other because matthew and i are from the same group so mm -hmm. i think we have to yes. preface that the icoc matthew yeah. of course in london me in los angeles so um you know, maybe tie that in uh, as far as how we even met as you or how we know each other as you tell your so, story. Yeah. Well, I'll start, I'll start with that. Just we, I was in the ICOC. So I was in the ICOC uh, for 15 years. Um, I did leave for about nine months, uh, which I'll come to later. It relates to something Hoyt said about when he left the group feeling like he was a burden. So uh, but I finally left in 2003 when quite a lot of people left which we'll go into later okay great um, but we had there was a church so the church started in boston um i think in about 79 really the, mm -hmm. the group call it a cult of church it kind of depends on but um uh i got met in 1988 and i was 20 years old got met met re recruited <laughs> Okay. You know, I was so I was walking. I was I was I was in Highgate, if you know London Highgate. I was sure. walking down to Highgate Tube Station, and I, uh, some guy, uh, I won't say his name, um, but he he invited me to a Bible discussion. He said, in fact, the first thing he said to me was, "Do you read the Bible?" <laughs> and I said, oh, "I read it every day," because I I'd, I'd started reading it three days before. So I've been reading it every day for three days. Okay. Um, and and I kind of at the time I really felt like God, this was God, and I didn't really want to go, but I did go um, to that Bible discussion. It was that evening, and uh, and the Bible really spoke to me when I went. It was on the Book of Ecclesiastes, hmm. which is if you know it at all, it's all about life being meaningless. Right. Uh, meaningless, meaningless. As a teacher, it's you know, mm -hmm. um, and and about trying to look for the meaning of life. Which kind of takes me back to, so kind of my background is I'm I'm from a Jewish background, but my my parents were secular. My father was um, an atheist, quite a well known atheist in Britain, kind of like a Richard Dawkins type atheist who'd go mm. and debate religious people. And, <laughs> um, and I grew up. I went to Church of England schools, and I sort of uh, believed in God for a while, but and sort of hit my teenage years, stopped believing in God, started getting into drugs. Uh, uh, you know, I was, I was in partly the reason I was doing drugs was the whole psychedelic thing. I was kind of like trying to find what is reality. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also around that time, uh, when I was about 17, 18 started to find life kind of meaningless. Like I came from quite a well-to-do family. I went to this posh school. I was talking to Hoyt about it at Westminster. Right. Um, 
you know, right in the heart of London. I kind of had everything I wanted, but I was it was like, what's what's the point? What's the meaning? And uh, but I didn't find it, and I carried on taking drugs, and things kind of got out of hand. A good friend of mine ended up killing herself. Someone I was very close to. Oh, I'm sorry. And about a week after her funeral, I had this LSD trip where I kind of felt like I experienced her. Mm. I apologize. It gets weird. There's no way of telling my story without all the weird <laughs> hey, stuff. Hey, we've all so, got um, weird tales. Don't worry. And that moment sort of changed. I started to believe in something other. That there mm. was, it wasn't even God at that point. It was just, there's life after death or there's spirits or there's something. There's some, because my dad had really convinced me that it was a very um, deterministic, uh, reductionist world. And then I sort of started seeking, but I was also doing a lot of drugs. And uh, and I kind of started to believe in God at some point. Uh, but I didn't really want to do what God wanted. It was sort of a battle going on between me and God. Mm. And I ended up getting, uh, you know, having lots of weird and wonderful ideas. And I ended up getting sectioned, which is in the American equivalent of getting committed with what they call drug-induced psychosis. Mm. And basically in the hospital, I said, God, I give up. I'll do whatever you want. I can't fight you. I'll do whatever you want. And there was a guy, I walked into the where the television was, and there was a guy there uh, reaching out to somebody else about saying, Jesus is up there, saying, save him, Father, save him. So I went up to this guy, and I prayed Jesus into my heart. And then uh, basically I got out of the hospital, and the first day I got out, I was met by the ICOC. So it was literally on the way to the, I was going to go and devote my life to doing voluntary work. Um, so, so I felt like I'd be really selfish, so, which I had been. Sorry, sorry to interrupt and, you, um, Matthew. And so this guy met me and then it, and it felt like, uh, you know, very much like it was God's plan. Hey, Matthew, and can as, you... as can... Shell knows, one of the key things you do in the ICOC is when you meet somebody, it doesn't matter if they're the Pope or, uh, you know, the head of the evangelical movement, you basically treat them like they're not a Christian right. and you study, you study the Bible with them because we had a very specific understanding of what it was to be a Christian. So you go through these series of studies, uh, uh, proving to them initially they're not a Christian. Mm. Nobody they know is a Christian. <laughs> Everybody's lost. Um, and this is the way you become a Christian. And it's they're using the Bible, and the Bible is a very powerful book. Whatever you believe about the Bible, uh, it's a very powerful book. And, and the scriptures really spoke to me. They really did. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, wow. Um, they, they did a, the one study that didn't, they do a study called the cross study where they really go into detail about how Jesus died for your sins, about how he was whipped and beaten and betrayed. And, and he did that all for you. And I, that was the one study I didn't really connect with. I was like, I couldn't really, mm. un, it didn't really, I thought he's God, you know, so I couldn't really understand that. But the other studies were really, they're very practical. So it's like, this is what you need to do. You need to, uh, be a fisher of men. Go out and help other people to become Christians. Your sins, you need to stop sinning. And these are all your, you know, uh, this is what repentance is. This is what baptism, this is the importance of baptism. Baptism is, is essential for salvation. This is how you get saved. And it's and some of it is, you know, is based in mainstream Christianity. It, it's not completely, like it's not, uh, it might be wacko, but it's not wacko compared to a lot of mainstream Christianity. Sure. Um, but they don't tell you, to be fair, you, you then have a discipler. So once you get into the church, I'm not sure. It's hard to know how much they do this on purpose, but certainly once you get into the church, you then ha you're assigned a discipler who is basically your mentor. But they're kind of like your priest, your counselor, your guide. And Matthew, you know, you want, Matthew, can yeah. I interject? You know that that's entirely on purpose you you yes. you don't know that stuff really before you're baptized it's true that's still in the but love I, I, that's the love bombing stage yeah. when everything is presented and even you know beautiful women or beautiful men at least in la oh you can't date that brother unless you're baptized everything pivots on your baptism because that's when they count you as a member and it, it rate you know what i mean it's all about how many members do we have? So yeah, no. If you're not if you're not baptized, you're not a member. And if you haven't got just in the old days, it has obviously the church or the 
the group, the cult has gone through some changes. So it's different. But in mm-hmm. the old days, no way could you have a, could you be in the group if you didn't have a disciple. Right. You have. Can I can I can I ask you also? That was um was the the church kind of instrumental in, in helping you kind of go off drugs? Like was that one of the things that was talked about when you entered into it, or how did that play well, out? To be fair, you see, so from my point of view, I, I think the church did provide a structure, mm-hmm. but I completely like when I turned to God in that mental. From my point of view, when I said to God, "I'll do whatever you want," I stopped smoking. I stopped taking drugs. Like I made a decision. I, I'm going to completely change my life. And then they met me after that. Right. So I'd already pretty much uh, stopped doing all the things that I was aware of that God didn't want me to do as I believed it at the time. And, 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 um, and you said you had, uh, said, you started. Yeah, they did provide us, you know, I was then sort of in a boot camp. So it did provide some structure. There was structure there, you know. Right. And I'd, I'd lived quite a, uh, wild life you know no absolutely I want to. Now, yeah now, now you yeah. said that uh the um that you you picked up the bible three days before you met them was there a catalyst to that like like was that part of that transition well again it was uh, it was because i i said this prayer in the mental hospital i said like god i'll do whatever you want then there was this guy preaching about jesus and and so i thought he obviously wants me to become a christian right so then i got the hospital to get me a bible and they actually refused. They thought I was kind of playing tricks or playing games with them. Mm-hmm. So I got a friend of mine to bring me a Bible. And they also they did get a priest to come and visit me. So right. a priest came and chatted to me. And I started looking at the Bible. And, and the only verse that really, again, this is a bit of a sidetrack, but the only verse that really stuck out to me, it said, if you hate your life in this world, you will save it. And if you love your life in this world, you will lose it. And and I thought, I, I at that point, I hated my life mm. in this world. You know, I was, I'd hit kind of rock bottom. Right. So mm-hmm. it can't be that simple. You know, I hate my life, so I'm going to save it. Uh, so I hadn't, you know, the Bible, if you pick up the Bible and just start reading it, it one of the things the Church of Christ was um, good at or used was the fact that they had a very clear kind of way into the Bible. Like, oh, this is what the Bible is teaching. Because, you know, you can pick up the Bible and start trying to read from Genesis. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You get to Exodus and Leviticus, and it's like, oh my gosh, what is this thing? Yeah. Or even start with the book of Matthew, and it's like the genealogies. It's like oh, the revelation. It's like, what's going on? So the church, the ICOC was very good at like, uh, I would regard it as a false path now, but at the time, giving you a path, this is what the Bible is really teaching. Right. It's, you know, you look at different scriptures to kind of get you there. No, it, it, your, your story reminds me a lot of your shell. You know, we talk about that perfect storm where, you know, you had just suffered through the death, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the family. And, and uh, you know, it's that type of thing where we're just at that place of trying to make sense of our, our lives. And then we seem to encounter something that seems to provide all the answers. And we're like, awesome. This well, is fantastic. Well, it seems divine yeah. at the time. Yeah. So that's fascinating. Yeah. And I mm-hmm. think that's, you know, it's a great thing to, to pass on to audiences that, um, you know, it just, uh, if, I, if I ever write an autobiography, I think I'll entitle it, Seemed Like a Great Idea at the Time. <laughs> and, uh, that's awesome. Because that's, that's what it feels like, right? I mean, it really does seem like the ducks are lining up to, to uh, you know, in essence, the universe is right. you know, conspiring in your favor. And, um, and that's what makes it really tough to untangle when things start to go wrong. So um, now you, you, you've eliminated... <laughs> That was one. I mean, I was in for fifteen years, and I would say I was, I was unhappy for fourteen and a half. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and when I sound happy, I mean like you know miserable. Like yeah. Um, yeah. You know, well, no, I, uh, and I think that brings. Inside. That but brings, I stayed because I totally believed it was where God wanted me. Yeah, exactly. And, and I and I think that's the dynamic that's great to illuminate is is we we fall in love with the initial idea and the and the premise mm-hmm. and the whole kind of the hooks yeah. go in and then and then we can convince ourselves that the fact that we're not experiencing it every day is our own fault because that's what the cult is teaching us right but i th- i think it's always important to talk about those things that you know you 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 gutted it out for 15 years so so what were the things that that made you stay i mean there had to be some positives uh that kind of 
you know, keep you going. I mean, you, you, anytime we tell these cult stories, we know we're saying the word cult. So we all know bad stuff happened. And so it's easy to talk about those things. And that is part of the story. But it's also really important to say, well, there are some good things happening. And that's what kept me hanging in. And so could you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, for me, uh, I mean, I was miserable a lot of the time. Like, so just to, just to explain that before I say the good stuff, the right. bad stuff was I, I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't, there was, when I first got baptized and afterwards, I felt very close to God. And then I found it very hard to get close to God. And part of the church, the ICOC thing was you go out of van, just do, if you're obedient, God will bless you. Mm-hmm. Obe- obedient meaning yeah. if you do what we say, God lot, will bless like, you. A lot of the time. A lot of the time. And yeah. certainly our interpretation of what the Bible yes, says. Yes, exactly. But so, and also the other thing was the leaders, it's working for the leaders. Look, look at, I know Shell was a leader. I, mm-hmm. I was like a small time leader occasionally. <laughs> Shell was like a big time leader, you know. But um, so I was always struggling. I was always like, you know, they'd always say, oh, you know, they always, They'd look at me and I had a kind of good education and sort of like had certain talent and they'd always want me to leave, but I could never overcome all my internal emotional struggles. So one of the things was you'd look at the leaders and think, well, they're doing it. God's blessing them. They're happy. They're joyful. They're fruitful, which is like converting other people. Um, And it really wasn't until the right, almost really at the end when I saw that really wasn't the case as well. Right. Was, it was not the oh. case. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Shell can speak to that. I, can, being I was one like, of the leaders. Yeah, yeah. I was one of the leaders, you know, crying in my I closet. <laughs> yeah. It took me years and a whole, and there was a kind of revolution in the church. It took me the, all of that to, for my eyes to eventually be opened. Mm-hmm. Um, but the good things, I mean, I, my wife is, was from the church. So we're still married. Oh, my great. best friend. I have a lot of friends who've left. I still have friends who are in, most of them are in a sort of a slightly more uh, uh, watered down version. But I do have friends who are in, the, in Kit McKean, who was the original uh, leader of the church, but he's now gone off and started his own thing because there was, you know, uh, what are they called? Schisms and stuff. So, uh, so I have a friend uh, who probably more than one friend who's in his group. So a lot of it, the people were great. There was some really idealistic lovely, uh, soft-hearted, gentle, um, great people. The only problem was that the nature of the cult was that those relationships happened often despite of the group. And often the nature... So I was close to one particular guy. He went into the ministry, which means working full-time for the church. He went on to become a good leader. It was very hard for us to maintain a good friend. I was like a struggling Christian. So it, the nature of the church was there was a very clear hierarchy. Yes. Kind of encouraged to really have friendships, good friendships with the people on your hierarchy level, especially if you were like an evangelist or a women's ministry leader, which were like the top level. And, and often the whole relationship was kind of supposed to be spiritual. So it was like you couldn't just be – you could be friends with somebody, but there was a lot of pressure on, well, how are your quiet times going? How are your Bible study and your prayer and your sin? And your, you know, so there was all these kind of, it was like having a relationship, but there was all these other strings and ulterior motives, other hidden agendas. There was a reason for everything. Even if you were put with someone to disciple them, it was to help them with something. Right. And I'm, I'm telling you what was going on behind the scenes Matthew, which I'm sure you know. But Michelle, you're talking about I'm to, you're talking about among the leaders, and that's no, I'm talking true. about even in the groups. People were put in groups because so and so could either challenge them or help them with something, yeah. or to keep them away from someone else. Well, this sister likes this brother, so they can't be in the same Bible talk. Everything was calculated and micromanaged way beyond anything I'm sure you're even now aware of. No, I totally accept that. And, I, I, you know, it was. And I I mean, it wasn't even hidden. You would ask, you know, can, if you wanted to go out with a particular sister, you know, you wanted a de- her to be your girlfriend, you'd have to ask your discipler. Your discipler would talk to her discipler. <laughs> My people her. will yeah. call your people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a lot of relationships were told, a lot of, you know, there were sometimes if, 
if they were if one one was black and one was white and they, they wanted they had leadership potential and they wanted it to be a black couple for a particular region mm-hmm. to go to a, a particular area or country they would break up that relationship or they would try and break up their relationship you could I know people who didn't, who refused to let that happen, but they were then ostracized. They were then right. taken out of leadership. There was consequences if you didn't go along with the leadership. Uh, if you didn't, if you weren't, as long as you didn't, uh, if you voiced your criticism loudly and clearly, you would uh, you would basically get kicked out. Like, mm-hmm. Wow. So be tolerant if you kept quiet about it, you know. But if you if you went and said, "This is what's happened. They shouldn't be doing this." That you know, that was like. You know, if you were critical of the leader, you were critical of God. Correct. Which is so. So. Place. So, was there a a watchdog kind of mechanism between everyone you interacted Absolutely. with? Absolutely. Yeah. That was the discipleship tree. Right. Yeah. You would wait on someone's porch why, to go get their tithe money. You would have to go talk. I mean, everything was. Um, were, were micromanaged. You, were you expected to kind of report back if you if you saw someone kind of? Of course. Like, would you would you were you expected to address it to the person in front of them, or you would kind of notice it and then go back to the the both? The, yeah. Okay. Both. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all. Yeah, I would say both. Kind yeah. Of well, and everything had a list, and everything was qualified, quantified stats, data. So we had a weak and struggling list of mm-hmm. people. That we had to either get off the weak and struggling list or basically, you know, call them to repent or push them out. Right. So, and I don't know if you guys did this in London or if you were aware of it, but we really, when, again, this is Los Angeles, which was the flagship example Mm -hmm. ministry, they called it, where Kip lived. Okay. So we had to be the highest standard of how it was done. And so... We ha- we would rate people. I can't remember what the numbers were. If it was one, I think it was one through five, on being completely sold out, a sold out disciple, and then down from there to a so, weak and struggling. So list. sold out is a positive. Oh, sold out is you're yeah. sold out disciple for Jesus. Right, right. You're fired up. You're sold out. You're faithful. Okay. And then you'd go down from there to the weak and struggling list. So we had charts <laughs> yeah. and graphs. So we knew who the weak and struggling were. Right. And then so there was plans to pull them back a in. Lot of, a lot of judgment going on, right? Oh, you think? Yeah. Well, wait, let me, so I don't, because I wasn't in leadership, I don't, you know, that stuff, and also you came out being slept. So I don't know, there probably was that at different times. There definitely were things like that. Yeah. Equivalence. But I can give you an example of what, when okay. the church was growing in like 93, we had something, I think they called it a revival, Basically, everybody was taken off the membership. So you were no longer, theoretically, in sort of ICOC terms, you were no longer saved almost. That was almost like you, were, you weren't going to heaven. Well, and then you, but the you list, to- we called the list, like if you were on our list as a disciple, it means, it, you know, the scripture, your name is written in heaven. So yeah. we would tell people, I mean, your name's not written in heaven. You're off. So, so they took everyone off the list. Okay, wow. off heaven's Ooh. list. Go ahead. <laughs> Everybody off the list, and then you had to kind of get back on. You had to like get with your disciple or the leader of the church, and you know there was there were situations where the husband was on the list and the wife wasn't. Right, right. Wow, that was messy. There's still, people who are hurt. I know people who are still when they they're still traumatized by what happened. No, I can imagine. It. The church a couple of years later said, "Yeah, we shouldn't have done that." You know, it was like even they realized they were wow. they kind of. But it was all like we've got to be. It was like this. It was it was really Kip. We we were all disciples of Kip. We yeah, correct. Disciples of, Jesus, disciples of Kip, and Kip said we've got to be a hundred percent committed. No look what we've got to be like, you know, out, you know, and and I, I think at a certain point he might have that might have been a genuine uh, passion and conviction and desire. I think over the years, so much evidence has accumulated of the damage that has been caused by that and the lack of love and the lack of Christ-like qualities. Yeah, the, I, the hypocrisy, oh, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Was, yeah, yeah. I think he's, he might have well started off sincere, I don't know, but at, at a certain point, it's very hard to understand. You have to close your eyes to a lot of things to keep doing what he's doing. You have to kind of basically right. put your hands on your and to a large degree not well, to that's, see the kind of that's that's where the 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 erosion of the critical thinking takes place right like you 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 start 
doubting that you have the capability to analyze the situation clearly and you have to keep looking upwards to the people above you to analyze what's really happening because mm-hmm. you don't trust yourself, right? Yeah. I mean, 100%, I did not trust myself. Yeah. Well, we're, we, were, we were taught to not trust ourselves. Yeah. That was called well, independent the hardest, the hardest and prideful. Yeah. above all else. So yeah. don't trust your instincts. You can't trust you know, your, your own instincts. Your emotions. Yeah. Your yeah. emotions might be telling you something. Uh, don't trust them. Yeah. The well, word of God as interpreted by the leadership. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, and the scriptures that they chose. I mean, the, the, the point I was making, though, Shell, just to be fair to even, even the people who were – so I was – generally my friends were like the lowest rung. We were like the struggling – Kind of Christians. You were on the weak and struggling list. Well, I was around for a long time, so I don't know. <laughs> probably, probably. But but even even with that, within our relationships, where there really wasn't an agenda, like we weren't, you know, working for the church, and mm-hmm. but, but we, the agenda was built in. So so the complications, but that sort of like a, a, a spider's web was going on even within the relationships even if you weren't in leadership, because we were all kind of indoctrinated with the same ideas. Mm -hmm. Leaders, the higher up you went, generally the more indoctrinated you were. And again, when the whole thing exploded, that kind of became obvious. It was actually the people, not always, but but often it was the people sort of who'd been struggling for years who who, who kind of most quickly went, oh yeah, I can see this as bullshit. You know, Um, Mm -hmm. whereas the people who'd been leaders found it a lot harder to kind of, deprogram themselves. Mm-hmm. Right. So so was this the catalyst that kind of started to get you out? Is this revival you're talking about? Or was it something? No, it was much. That was 93. So I I left. So I struggled for like seven years. Right. Pretty much all the time feeling like God was angry with me, that I was failing, that what's wrong with me, you know, sinning, coming I mean, back, sinning, you know. And then in, in 95, I just said, I can't do this anymore, God. Like, and I, I left believing I was going to hell. Mm-hmm. Right. I left. I, I remember you saying what about you yeah. left the group because you felt like you were yeah, a burden. Yeah, I, I can totally identify with your sentiments there, my brother. Yeah. Leave a group. And I, I know people who've left the group to this day who, who still believe the doctrine. Yeah. Correct. They left yeah. Before 2003 helped a lot of people to kind of open their eyes. But so I left, you know, and I, I went back and, and my family were really supportive of me. My uh, some old friends, not all my old friends, but a, a, a few of my old friends were really there for me. But again, all the time I was thinking, I've got to go back. I've got to get. I've got to save my family. I've got to save sure. myself. I've got to. And eventually, I had a kind of vision from God, and I went back. And then things did start to change. At that point, I did start to. I started looking at other verses in the Bible that we didn't emphasize about grace, about faith, about mercy, and I started to question the whole emphasis on stats i mean shell talks about stats it was like goals and stat it was like a multi-marketing yeah you know it really was it everything was, like, was rated know, well yeah you know i mean it we, were fires. we were great we would have done great at that um and i i started to realize that it felt you know the, the legalistic it felt like this is all works like where's our relationship with god right and it got to the point actually went and challenged the leader of the London church who at the time was Mark Templer. He's quite famous in the church. And I sort of said, you're like Pharaoh, you know, giving us, trying to get us to make these bricks, but you're not giving us any faith to do it with. And nothing really came of that. I kind of like, I had a little bit of a, I, you know, I felt I was going to start my own church, but then it was like, I, I didn't, I couldn't even start my own car. I kind of like, all my energy got zapped out of me. <laughs> wow. So I stayed in the church for another seven years another five six seven years i went i went to jerusalem on uh, so there was a small church there i really enjoyed i was studying on a Hebrew. mission really like a little that. mission team right it was a little mission team yeah and that was great in mm-hmm. fact some of the smaller churches because there was less kind of like the structure couldn't quite be imposed on like 12 people <laughs> there actually were kind of, you could actually relationships would break through mm-hmm. and there was more normality but that but the structure would always be kind of trying to impose itself. You've got to go and reach out to a thousand people in one day. We did that once in Jerusalem. We reached out to a thousand people. We fasted and it was like, you know. In one day? 
one day there was about 10 of us we were about 100 people each you know and it was because the leader of the jerusalem church had gone to a conference in wherever in america and come back saying this is what we've got to do to get committed to get it was all about church growth and he was probably under pressure as well yeah because if he numbers, the church growth, numbers, he would be cool numbers, numbers, he loved being yep. in jerusalem he didn't want to be pulled back to america in shame you know he wanted to stay so he, he, you know, I'm not saying these were his motives, but this definitely was the motives of a lot of leaders. Mm-hmm. If your mind does not crank, as in grow, you will get demoted. You will get moved. You will get, you know, you will lose your job if you're working for the church. Mm-hmm. A lot of pressure on leaders. And that's yeah. ultimately about money then, isn't it, really? Or would it's you about say? growth. It's about there was so much... Um, pride and competition between the churches. I don't know if you ever felt that, Matthew, but so-and-so's group has grown this much and they're so faithful. So they'd be kind of the the gold standard for a while. And then the leaders from that group would get flown in to talk about how they grew their church so much. But there was so much competition and comparison and pitting us against each other to grow our group. Because yes, it was about numbers and yes, it was about tithe money I think more more than anything, it was the the bragging rights, the arrogance, because we were called the fastest growing church in the world mm-hmm. for many years. I mean, um, we were featured on 2020, Inside Edition, MTV, mm-hmm. um, Fox News about this radical church that was growing, growing, growing. And we would, in LA, Matthew, we would have a big screen up at like the Biltmore or another big hotel where the LA, all the LA church would meet. And we would watch these news stories and cheer and be like, yes, we can count ourselves as persecuted because they weren't positive stories. They were like, watch out for this group. They might steal your children from campus. And we'd be oh, like, oh, really? yeah. Oh, oh, so you, 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 oh, we love we loved that stuff. We loved the persecution oh, because How? in the Bible, it says if if you are like Jesus, you will be persecuted. Right, gotcha. So we marked it as a qualification that we were like Jesus. Wow. And if you're not getting persecuted, kind of genius. Right? You're doing something wrong. Yeah. And so we'd be like, the whole world is watching. Yeah. We're so awesome. <laughs> right? Barbara Walters mentioned our church. Rawr. Now, and we'd have now, music. Was anyone using the, the, the cult word back then? Around oh, the, no. Okay. I mean, oh, the, the media was. Oh, the media was. The yeah. media was. Yeah. But then we were like, well, even Jesus was called a cult leader. Because mm-hmm. in the Bible, it says, what sect are you from? Right. Sect is another word for cult. Sure. So if we were called a cult, didn't bother us at all. Now, now did, did uh, and I'm curious to hear your point of view on this as well, Matthew. Did you, did you look at other groups and think that they were cultic oh we preached about it absolutely mormons jehovah witnesses scientology those are crazy cults because they weren't following the bible like we were yeah right if you look at mormons they have additional yeah yeah book of mormon we did the same thing in my in my group we 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 could identify other groups and all the flaws and the right you know uh, unnecessary control or whatever way we would demonize them but yeah, that it's it's amazing looking back on the inability to look in the mirror and look at my environment and see that that was exactly what we were doing. Right. It's fascinating to kind of go through that um, and think you're on the outside looking in mm-hmm. to finally come realize that you've been inside the whole time. Right. It's yeah. that matrix that we've yeah, talked about. Totally. Yeah. It's crazy. Definitely. So, so, so Matthew, take yeah. take us through the steps of kind of you know led you to the point of where you um, decided to make a break. So, uh, so this, so basically I was still miserable. I, w- I was kind of like, uh, okay, I'm going to be stuck here till I'm dead. I'm just gonna have to wait until I die. And I've got some issues I need to talk to God about. Right. I'm not happy with the situation, but I kind of felt like God wanted me there again. It was still like, well, God wants me here. What can I do? And I did like, there were, you know, I had friends who left, uh, most of them left because, they couldn't hack, you know, it was like, oh, they just wanted to go and do whatever they wanted to do, which obviously was completely reasonable. Some of them did leave because it's like, oh, no, this is wrong. This isn't like, we shouldn't be doing this. And they actually kind of had a different perspective on the Bible. I had, so I had some of that. I could see some of it. So I, w- I didn't join in. Towards the end, I was more and more reticent about joining in like evangelism campaigns. And 
I wouldn't always listen to my disciples' advice. And I was kind of doing my own thing, but I couldn't quite bring myself to leave because I still felt it was the one true church. And then in 2003, uh, Mark Temple, who I mentioned, was still leading the London church. He he went, so Kit McKean uh, resigned or stepped down because his daughter left the church. But he didn't, daughter, step, he didn't step down. He was forced. Just well, again, so, yeah. I'm talking about what I heard at the time. What you so, heard, right. Since yeah. then, I've heard a lot of stuff. But at the time, from my point of view as a low-rung disciple, I just heard like, oh, yeah, he's taking a sabbatical because his daughter's fallen away. And he kind of forced other people to come out of the ministry because their children have fallen away. So he, they, fallen I think away, what that fall, really was, fallen the away. Matthew, the cl- Matthew, clarify that for a second. Falling away means they stopped going to the church. Oh, they so left the church. we would say that they've fallen away from God. Totally. Yeah. We did not believe if somebody left the church, they left God. There yeah. was no difference. Yeah, we, ha- we have to decipher the loaded language. Right. Uh, yeah. That's why I interject. Yeah. 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 So, so Kip had gone. I, th- I think what happened, and Michelle will probably know more about this than I do, the, the, the layer underneath him who were called the world sector leaders, there were seven people, uh, men with their wives, who um, basically they, they'd apportion the world in these seven areas. Mm-hmm. So these guys were like the next layer down from Kip. They were like the world sector leaders. You know, I wanted to be a world sector leader. <laughs> uh, nothing I wanted more. So they... Um, they were the next layer down. I think they basically turned on Kip because I think they were tired of like being like bashed by him and like bossed mm-hmm. around. So they turned on him. But then I think what happened was, so they kind of got him into, into this sabbatical situation. But then I think the group under him, the geographical sector leaders, people who led groups of about a thousand, they then also had issues with the world sector. So they had this big conference somewhere like LA. I don't know what Baltimore, I have no idea, somewhere in America. Mark Templer was there as a mediator. This is the end of 2002. So he saw all this stuff going on. He came back to London and thought, <laughs> he thought, I'm sure the London church, I'm sure none of my staff have any of these issues about being controlled. Or, I'm sure none of them have, but let me just check. <laughs> let me go that up with them. <laughs> so the first session was three hours of them, like telling him what they really thought of him that he threatened to send them to India if their ministry wasn't cranking, that he'd <laughs> you know, ban certain books because he'd force them to have, like, our quiet times. He'd, you know, he controlled, he'd, you know, all this stuff. And then, and I was hearing about it because I had a friend who was on staff who was telling me that he was, like, my mole, my deep, my deep throat in the situation. <laughs> all this stuff. I was going, no, man, this, this is the stuff I've been saying. This is what I've been saying for the last, like, five years. I've been saying this stuff. And I kept waiting, like, for Mark Templer to call me, you know, and say, hey, this is the stuff you told me five years ago. What else do you know? (laughs) I never got got that call. Um, (laughs) What insights do you have for me, Matthew? (laughs) And I got quite quite a few at that point. I I wasn't where I got to, but I definitely was like, I'd seen quite a lot of stuff. And um, anyway, they had another session, which lasted about six hours, again, of them, like, (laughs) pouring out all their hurts, all their issues, you know, there was all sorts of dysfunctional relationships, all sorts of crap was coming out. Mm-hmm. Started to filter out to the rest of the church. Again, people like me who'd be going, well, I actually raised this issue like 10 years ago, or I've been raising this issue with my discipler. And so this, it started to bubble underneath. And then uh, we started to, Mark stepped down. Mark basically was kind of forced to step down. He, he had a, a large kind of group meeting where he apologized for his harshness and he apologized for banning this book and, and his wife, Nadine, apologized for all this stuff. And I, at that point, I thought, oh my gosh, the, the church is going to change. This is it. We're going to, we can actually be, we can really change. Um, what happened was, and this is quite a long story, so I don't know how much to... Well, actually, you know, we're, we actually, we should probably hope we're going to stay on that cliffhanger because I think we'll bring that in the second episode because, um, yeah. you know, we've, because uh, I think, I think that's a great place to kind of mm-hmm. entice people to come back for episode two. And, um, and of course, then we get into the stuff, which I love the most, which is the aftermath that people don't really, you know, like... It's it's such a critical break point to get out of these things, but then the the hard work really begins afterwards. So uh, let's pick that up again mm-hmm. in the next episode. Um, but uh, it's an absolutely fascinating story, and I'm, and I'm 
so thrilled to hear that um, that there was a kind of a safety net to fall into, that, that you weren't the only one leaving around that time or you knew people had left before because that's such a critical part of this story is mm-hmm. how, who, where do you, where's that blanket you fall into afterwards? So I'm yeah. very interested to hear about all that. And, uh, yes. Let's wrap this one up and pick it up uh, All right. The next time. Well, I'm gonna. You know how I do. You Boy, do, I'm gonna. Do. I'm gonna read our our quote. Thank you so much, time. Matthew. Well, here's here, here's our. Let's Thank close you. out. Let's close out with our our quote because it's also a good uh, wrap up slash segue to mm. what we're gonna talk about in part two of Matthew Wolpert. Did I say it right? Perfect. Wolpert. Perfect. <laughs> okay. You own everything that happened to you. Tell your stories. If people wanted you to write warmly about them, they should have behaved better. By our friend Anne Lamont. All right, people. Tune back in. Watch your hearts and your minds. No one should have control of those except you. We'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Uh